What's up, Goldie here? And I'm going to be going over the big 13-game main slate here. Uh, hopefully quickly. Uh, we don't want this to run for two freaking hours. But um, huge, huge slate. I think this may be the biggest one we've had uh, all season, if I remember correctly. Um, we've got a lot of arms that we can get to. ton of offenses, though, that I think are... Uh, far more playable. Um, I mean, this is a 13-game slate. We can we can get to a lot of different spots here, and I think generally on on huge huge slates like this, a pretty equitable way to construct things is just focus in on, um, you know, it, a pitcher pool of like half a dozen guys or something like that. And and then really spread out a ton of offenses uh, because on a full 13 gamer, there's a lot of pitchers that are probably going to get beat up pretty good here tonight. So, um, you know, naturally, since pitchers are, are far more projectable, it's easier to just kind of zero in on the really good plays on such large slates like this and just play play the numbers, play good numbers, um, play good projections, right? and and good values where we can find them and then really spread out a ton of different offenses there's never a shortage of value that we can find in a batter's box of course um so that allows us to get to some more expensive guys that doesn't mean we have to be eating 11 5 um or north of 10k on on a pitcher for most of our pitcher ownership or anything like that right do we have to eat a full 30 percent on zach allen tonight um, no, we don't have to. Can you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's kind of how I generally like to structure 13 gamers or, you know, very large slates like this. Um, they just go after some some guys on the mound that I, I really do like and then spread out my offenses. Um, unless there's just a couple of super obvious smash spots that I like. We got a couple of those today, of course, too. Um you know, of course, things always depend and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think that's generally a pretty decent way. Just find a few pitchers that we like and then and spread them with a bunch of the um, bunch of the teams that we really think could serve us well in tournaments. So that said, uh, spiel aside, let's just get into it. So many games here. We're going to try and go quickly and stay mostly out of the numbers here um, to speed things up. Cal Quantrill going for Cleveland and Kyle Gibson going for Baltimore. Now, at these respective price tags, 62 for Quantrill, 75 for Gibson, I think both of these guys are in play, far le just at their price tags. Uh, far less playable is Cal Quantrill. He only has a 13% aggregate K rate here, and this is Baltimore. Um, they are uh, you know, against righties this year, just a break-even offense, but this is a pretty upside contact spot for them, full 85% contact rate. For Cal Quantrill, he's a sequencer, right? And he tries to induce soft contact to both sides of the plate in order to stay out of jams. He tries to keep the baseball on the ground, and he does pretty well. So, in in uh, keeping the baseball down with uh, against lefties, right? Um, less so against righties. Neutral ground ball to fly ball there. And overall, he's kind of hard to attack sometimes. He is a, he's a pretty decent arm. Like I said, he sequences very well. He's got a really equitable fastball mix. And that's what keeps him out of a lot of trouble. He doesn't walk a lot of people, and he stays off of the barrel. right? So he, he just doesn't have a lot of impressive swing and miss stuff. On a full 13-game slate, um, the, pl the price tag does make him playable. It's, it's very hard to get there with, with Cal because I think his upside is capped at probably 20 points. And especially in this matchup, uh, we're not really interested in attacking Baltimore necessarily with a very low upside arm. Uh, you need somebody like a Logan Allen, for example, who's going to be able to run deep into a game and get some K stuff. Because uh, you're going to need probably 30 from both of your starting pitchers to win tournaments tonight. Kyle Gibson, I'm not sure he has 30 in the tank either. This is a bad strikeout matchup for him, and he didn't throw it past anybody himself. So, um, you know, at their price tags, they're in play, but fundamentally, this is not a good spot really for either guy, right? Kyle Gibson gets Cleveland. They don't strike out, even though this offense is just so, so bad. 
Uh, they don't hit for any power whatsoever. Even Josie Ramirez not hitting the baseball down a line in a gap or over the wall this year. So they've been super frustrating. Um, and that doesn't mean I've, you know, because these guys pitched to come up so much contact, doesn't really mean I want to play either of the offenses necessarily, because I think they're still serviceable enough. Cleveland is bad enough that Kyle Gibson, even though he's not all that impressive, he can get there. At least he's got three pitches this season that are giving him some equity. Um, Cal Quantrill, same sort of deal, a little bit of equity with three pitches. They've all got, you know, a lot of junk in the arsenal, and that's kind of what these guys have to do in order to survive. I wouldn't be surprised if either of them pop for a serviceable score. Uh, 20 to 22 or something is perfectly within range for both of these guys in these particular matchups. Um, offensively, I'd obviously just side with Baltimore and go after Cal, but because Cleveland getting there with them on a, on a full 13 game slate is going to be insanely difficult. Just one offs, I think, for them is the best I can do. A couple playable pieces. Um, prices coming down a little bit on like Stephen Kwan and Andres Jimenez. Josh Naylor still at a three three K flat. You know, so hard to play these guys though um, with such little power. Josie's down to 52. You can always play him, but uh, you know, hard to to really get too excited about offense here. Really hard to get excited about pitching because they're, these guys aren't going to throw a pass anybody. So kind of a write-off for me in the early going outside of some Baltimore. Uh, Milwaukee and Toronto, Adrian Hauser on the mound. Same thing for him. Just doesn't have a lot of raw whiff stuff anymore. Had it, it displayed a little bit of it in his, uh, earlier in his career, I should say. Um, but he's more of a contact guy. Pitches to a lot himself. 84% here. Now, it's kind of difficult in this particular spot to try and go after Toronto. When we go after Toronto, we need to have guys that can throw it past them. Um, sequence well with a really good breaking pitch arsenal. And Hauser really can't throw it past them necessarily. He throws a, a two-seamer. Four-seamer is really not that good. He's throwing these two fastballs a lot. It's a full 70% of the arsenal nearly. Now, the, the breaking stuff for him is pretty decent. Slider, curveball, that keeps him way down in the strike zone. Uh, which can make him serviceable. So at 6,300, he is also in play, uh, but it's going to make it very hard to get to because this is Toronto. They're not going to strike out a lot, and he's only got a 17% aggregate K rate with a 7% swinging strike rate. Huge strand rate here at 85%. Obviously a short sample, um, but he's got expected suppression metrics about a run, run and a half higher than his realized ERA here. So I think... It's going to be difficult and hard to fully stack against Hauser because he doesn't really walk people and he stays off the barrel with a very high ground ball rate. So getting there in in tournaments, it's going to be difficult with Toronto, I think, to for them to hit the baseball over the wall. Now, they'll make some hard contact, but it, it, they're a, <laughs> it's going to be really hard for him to hit the, hit the baseball in the air here in this particular matchup. And they don't really have all that many raw fly ball hitters outside of like a Matt Chapman um, from the right side. And that's really how we kind of like to attack. Hauser has a, a slightly elevated um, hard contact rate to the right side. And both sides are, will hit for a little bit of average here. So that keeps Toronto in play from that perspective. And, and just a raw contact rate. There's going to be a lot of contact from Hauser. I think that makes them playable. Um, but at their particular price tags, outside of Matt Chapman, I'm not super thrilled with playing much of these guys. Bichette and Vladdy and Springer and, and Witt and even Varsho, they're fine, right? Um, but, you know, and they're popping north of five in the in the run total. So I think they're, they're a playable stack for sure. There's going to be a lot of contact. But uh, to get the baseball up and over the wall might be a little difficult especially from the right side with a near 3-0 ground ball to fly ball ratio here. Not a lot of line drives. Probably a little difficult for Toronto. Yusei Kikuchi going for them on the mound. 8,400. He's still got his problems to right-handers, man. 56% um, strike one. He's not walking people necessarily, but the, the raw K stuff is not all that impressive. It's nowhere near the 24, 25% that he has displayed in the past. And he's still giving up a lot of hard contact to both sides here. A little noisy. I mean, 
certainly noisy to lefties here, just a 10-inning sample. But we've got a 41 and a third here to righties just this season, and he's still giving up a 37.5% hard contact rate. 2.4 homers per nine, 292 average allowed, 373 Woba with a 238 ISO all to right-handers. With an 092 ground ball to fly ball, north of 21% line drive rate, right? These are very attackable numbers against righties. At 8,400, I think this price tag puts him in play only because the Brewers have just been atrocious against left-handed pitching. But I think this is probably a spot I've been waiting for them to bounce even just a little bit, just to be somewhat better against lefties. And I think we might start to see that here. This is a really good matchup for a lot of their righties. They're going to run probably eight righties here tonight against Kikuchi. And it's hard for him to get righties out, man. A full 292 average allowed in a platoon split is a big, big number. Uh, 11.5% barrel rate. Very hard and loud contact still to opposite-handed hitters. Um, And in this very short sample, he's given it up a little bit to the lefties as well. As I mentioned, he's just not throwing it past them, and he's giving up baseballs in the air. So if I had to side with an offense, even though they've been much, much worse, uh, it'd probably be Milwaukee. I like the batted ball matchup better for them and all of their right-handers against Kikuchi in particular rather than Toronto's righties against Hauser. So um, I think it's a very intriguing tournament game here. And I think you could probably get off of some Toronto and just get to some other offenses due to this very high ground ball rate from Hauser and get to maybe a couple of Brewers pieces. You don't want to full stack the Brewers necessarily because they're terrible. But a couple of these pieces, Owen Miller, Willie Contreras, sure, they're they're very playable, absolutely. Uh, Okay, let's move on. Philly and the Mets. Ranger Suarez, he has not been good in his first couple outings. 5,200 for him. That's kind of an insane price tag. Uh, last season we were playing when he was right we were paying you know upper 8ks sometimes um, mostly mid to you know mid 7ks 8ks somewhere around there for Ranger uh, he's got a two seamer change mix that he really tries to stay down in the strike zone with and that's what's given him a lot of success same with the curveball he's mixing in this cutter slider combination now a little bit as well trying to induce more soft contact and that's really how Ranger tries to survive. Uh, But I think he is a bit of a victim of um, a delay in his his routine, having been hurt for the first couple months of the season. And this is a terrible matchup for him, strikeout-wise. He's never really been a very high strikeout pitcher, and he's given up some pop historically to the right side of the plate. Can't really take anything out of these numbers. He's only got three starts here. Um, But historically, we've wanted to go after him with some righties, because the ground ball rate is lower, the hard contact rate is higher, and the power numbers are obviously higher, right? And he mainlines sort of a, a two-seamer changeup mix. And this two-seamer, when it's bad, it will float, and it's a really, really bad pitch to opposite-handed hitters. So um, that will sort of filter down a little bit to the changeup as well. And that could put a lot of the Mets righties in a pretty decent spot here tonight. Notably, Pete Alonso, 5,500, I think is a playable price tag for him. Frankie Alvarez, if they've got him still up in the two hole at 31, I think that's an excellent catcher play here tonight. Frankie Lindor at 48, you can play him for sure in some stacks. I think my favorite little three man would be like in Alvarez, Pete Alonso, Mark Vientos maybe. Cheap enough to really allow you to get to some more balanced builds with a more expensive offense, like a couple we'll get to here in a little while, and some more expensive arms on the mound. Uh, I think that's a very playable. I'm not really interested in playing Ranger tonight. Uh, he's going to have to show me something and show me that he can blast through what's admittedly a pretty low upside lineup, uh, but one that doesn't strike out. So he's going to have to show it to me here. But at 5200 this is an attractive price tag. If you need to get down here and you want to stack the whole country... Um, including your pitchers, that, that that's okay to land on 5,200. He has upside at this price tag against this uh, pretty low upside offense. Could I say, I'm just not doing it, man. Uh, I, I cannot do it. It's every damn start with this guy that he cannot throw it over the plate. He walked five batters again in his last start. Um, so the, the price tag is just too high. Now, I, I like that the ownership is depressed now, but that's mostly buoyed just by the attractive strikeout stuff. But uh, if you can't walk fewer than than 10% of your of the hitters that you face, um, or less than 10%, I should say, 
and you're just putting everybody on base for free. You spike your pitch count, and you put you put me in a difficult spot because I, I can't pay this price tag for you when you're only going to go five innings. I need six and seven inning upside at, at the least when I'm paying 10, 10 K for a guy, especially on a full 13 game slate. And I just can't do it with Kodai Senga. Um, now if this ownership drops off a cliff to like 6%, that puts him in play a little bit more. And then you could maybe consider stomaching a 15% walk rate, but I just can't, I just can't do it uh, at this particular price tag. He needs to be 8,000 for me to start to get, uh, really excited about this. The walks are awful, man. Um, and the Arsenal's really not all that impressive. The split has not been very good. Slider's been very bad, too. So the only pitch that's offering him any value whatsoever so far is the cutter, and that's keeping him a little bit down in the strike zone, especially to lefties. Of course, the split keeps him down as well. Um, but if the four-seamer's bad and slider is very likely to be bad and the splitter, he can't throw this anywhere near the plate... Then he's got only one good pitch that he could survive with, um, you know, and that's really been the M.O. for Kodai Senko so far this year. So despite the attractive K stuff for him, I hate the walk rate. It's to both sides of the plate. He just can't throw it anywhere near the strike zone, uh, and that takes me totally off him at this particular price tag. So I'm not, I'm kind of off of the Mets here a little bit uh, outside of some short stacks. Uh, I really don't want to play Kodai Senko with. I just need more from him, and it's got to be fewer walks. Uh, okay, Cincinnati and Boston. Ben Lively's been good in his last couple of starts. Um, the first two outings of, of the season for him were just out of the bullpen. And in his last couple of starts, in two uh, not terribly difficult matchups, St. Louis certainly a difficult matchup. Yankees, maybe not so much. Uh, but he's gone five and two-thirds in six innings in the Yankees and, and Cardinals starts respectively with eight strikeouts in each and only given up two runs. So I think this is a playable price for him. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's a playable spot. This is a very hard team to get through. Um, the Boston Red Sox over here against right-handers, they've been fantastic all season. They're dropping off a little bit. They've been quite disappointing in the last couple of weeks against righties, but they're still not striking out a lot, and it still makes them very hard to get through. 172 ISO, 32% hard contact rate. They're buck 25 ground ball to fly ball. They're hitting more balls on the ground now, and Verdugo and and, and Yoshida, those these guys are starting to, you know, their ground ball rates are really starting to, show out a little bit um Devers have been out of the lineup a little bit so their numbers have kind of dropped off the clip he's back but he's 6100 today and that's kind of hard to get to on a full 13 game slate really no matter who you are um Yoshi does 5900 right and Alex Verdugo still 5000 Jaron Duran is a fine and playable 3800 here Justin Turner, he has third base eligibility again so that's nice don't have to play him at sole first base that makes him slightly more playable He's not going to strike out. 3,700, though, still a pretty low upside bat, uh, no matter how you slice it for Justin Turner anymore. So, um, Christian Koss is fine at 2,700. Not my favorite to play Boston here tonight. I think they're fine just because they're popping really, really hard. It's warm in Boston, and you probably expect Ben Lively to regress a little bit from his last couple of starts, right? 93% strand rate so far. It's a noisy because of the um because of the couple bullpen outings but an 088 whip that's pretty unlikely to continue for him so we'll see uh i'm in wait and see mode with lively i want to see him you know go after a really good lineup like this i don't want to go out of my way to target him he's throwing a lot of stuff here and that could very well make him serviceable against the red sox tonight with a full six pitches and it like i said they've been good so far uh but i want a, a bit more um from lively here before i start going after some really dangerous offenses like the red sox brian bayo on the mound i think this is very playable i'd much rather play him at 7,000 against the reds well the reds are worse let's start there uh and bayo's better like the okay that's number two right so everything has been great for bayo this season um still a little noisy right it, it, certainly in the Raw whiff stuff to the left side of the plate. 19% aggregate K rate. Still giving up a little bit of pop. Some Woba for sure. 384 with a full 328 average. This is a noisy sample, of course. But he's still giving up a lot of hard contact there and very susceptible. So that would be like TJ Friedel, Jake Fraley, maybe like a, you know, I don't know, a Will Benson um, kind of territory. 
But outside of that, they're mostly right-handed heavy here, and they're probably going to have six righties in the lineup. And Bale's been excellent against the the righties in particular this season. 240 average, far better. 320 Wova, far better. 213 ISO, still some pop, right? So the hard contact issues are still um, providing some concern for Bayo here. But he's very spread out in the arsenal with the four-seamer, two-seamer slider change. Sequence, starting to sequence really well, but the slider has been pretty dreadful. Um, and he's floating this a lot, and that's where a lot of the hard contact is coming from. Not spotting so much with the four-seamer. Two-seamer's been better, but overall, just kind of a break-even arsenal, and then you throw the slider in there, which has been really, really bad. So that makes him very attackable, mostly with left-handers, like I said, but at 7,000 against righties this season, the Reds have been uh, very attackable, to say the least. 88 WRC plus with a 24.5% strikeout rate. Just 27% hard, 131 ISO. Not a lot of power from them. A lot of pop-ups and infield fly balls here at a full 14%. That's a huge number. So really low upside offense, even though Johnny India has really come on and hit jacks in the last several days. Um, so I think Brian Bale is playable here at, at 7,000, as are some of the Red Sox. I prefer to play Bayo to Ben Lively, of course, at the basically the same price tag. Um, but I'm not I'm just kind of lukewarm on, on most of it. If I had to choose it'd probably be like uh, a Bayo Sox lively reds something like that um but really not super interesting um to me necessarily despite the very high run total that the Red Sox are popping for tonight they're gonna be hard to get to because they're very expensive uh okay let's move on Kansas City and the Cardinals I think this is one of the few spots that we might be able to get really excited about stacking against Granky here tonight um first of all the ownership on the Cardinals is going to come in pretty low uh, relative to some of the other teams here. And that's how I like stacking against Granke. He, the stacks against him normally are very popular, and he doesn't get blown apart all that often. Um, we know, as we've talked about, basically in his last four starts, five starts, he gives up about three runs, goes about five innings, strikes out about two guys. And that's a pretty consistent outing for him. In good matchups, he has upside, for 20, 22 points or whatever, in bad matchups, he could get blown apart pretty good. And it has happened once or twice this season. And I think this could probably be one of those with the Cardinals. It's a very hard offense to get through. They're not going to strike out a lot. And they've been far better than they were earlier in the season when you probably would have been pretty comfortable about playing Granky against them, uh, to be quite honest. But we've seen the numbers for them in aggregate continue to drift up the WRC Plus at a, a buck 06 now. 171 ISO still because of the very high hard contact rate against right-handers, 35%. Historically, Grinke has given up a little bit more hard contact to righties, and that's persisting once again this season. He's giving up a little bit more power and average to the left side, so that makes this a very playable stack for the Cardinals. A couple of the guys at the top, however, um, expensive. Goldschmidt, Gorman, and Arenado. you got to pay for these guys. Everybody else mostly pretty playable. And certainly a couple of the guys down at the bottom of the line, like Alec Burleson, Brendan Donovan types, will make it cheaper. We'll see what they want to do at the top. Uh, Lars got hurt, uh, I believe, yesterday. So it could very well be a Tommy Edmond that they lead off. He's at a playable 4,100 for sure. We like him a little bit better from the right side, so not my favorite. But he's got dual eligibility now, and that makes him a playable piece in stacks, of course. So 4,900 for Gorman is a little tough to stomach uh, at... Oh, he actually did get third base um, eligibility here today. So uh, that makes him far more playable than a, a sole second base play. Uh, so it makes the Cardinals a little bit easier to stack here with some maneuverability in the uh, positional eligibility on, on DK. So I think getting to the Cardinals here is, like I said, it's probably going to be a little bit off the board relative to some other teams here. And going after Granke... Uh, I think is, is probably pretty warranted here today. Michaelis on the other side. I think you can play the Royals as well. I don't want to play Michaelis, despite how bad the Royals are against right-handed pitching. I mean, can you do that? Could you land on him in, like, some correlated Cardinal stacks? Yeah, because he's probably going to get some run support. But, I mean, I'm not excited about this at all. He's given up a lot of hard contact to the left side here. 315 average, 365 Woba, and 176 ISO to the lefties. Just an 18% K rate, effectively neutral ground ball to fly ball. It's the line drives against Michaelis here that are a major problem. 27% line drive rate to both sides here. 40% hard contact to lefties. 
the contact, you know, as far as hard to soft contact ratio is a little bit better to the right side. Um, but Michaelis is not getting ground balls. Historically, he's been a high ground ball pitcher, but that is not the case this season at all. Uh, really not getting any value out of the fastball mix whatsoever. He's flattened out the two-seamer usage that used to keep him so far down in the strike zone and moved a little bit more over the four-seamer, but it has been terrible, and he's right over the middle of the plate. Hasn't been able to spot this, and the curveball's been bad too, which is another pitch that's, that's kept him down in the strike zone. So um, I want to get to some Royals here. They still make a lot of hard contact against righties as well, 35% themselves. Buck 53 ISO. Yeah, they're going to strike out a lot, but are we worried about that with Michaelis? Not with a 17.5, 18% aggregate strikeout rate. So um, I think the Royals are probably going to see a little bit of an uptick in their run creation in this particular matchup as well. So I like getting to them. They're pretty balanced. They've got a couple of guys from the right side that you're fine playing. Bobby Witt at 57 is kind of stiff after his huge day over the weekend. Um, or I guess at the end of last week, maybe. Salvi is, is very playable, 52. But all of the lefties, certainly. Uh, Prado, Vinny, and MJ are, are playable. Michael Massey's been heating up a little bit. He's at a playable 2,200 for sure. Um, Nicky Lopez had a, a four-hit day yesterday, and he's been stealing a bag here or there. So I think the Royals are very much playable. You can stack this game as well. Uh, it's warm in St. Louis. Maybe keep an eye out for pop-up storms, things like that. But the baseball flies, and this ballpark plays a lot more hitter-friendly when it's warm. So uh, I think you could see some offense really on both sides here. If you want to play some Michaelis, I don't think that's horrible. Um, but I obviously I'd mostly side with the Cardinals, but I'd probably go Cardinals, Royals, and then like a ways, and then both pitchers, uh, if I had to choose. So like that game a little bit for some hidden offense. Let's move on. Tampa and Chicago, Shane McClanahan on the mound. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, 11, four. That's really the only thing that's taken me off of this year. Um, it's not really that the Cubs are excellent against left-handed pitching and they, they really are 120 WRC plus. 550 PA sample, it's uh, it's short still for a full team aggregate, um, obviously compared to where we'll be at the end of the season, of course. 25% K rate, that makes them very attackable here. Despite the run creation and a couple of guys like a Chris Morrell, uh, who is just like Ted Williams here, uh, and Patty Wisdom that'll hit the ball over the wall, Dansby's been a little bit better recently. Uh, Seiya Suzuki has been pretty good recently as well. Um, Jay McClanahan is a well above average lefty here, so I don't really want to be playing some of these high upside right-handers from the Cubs against a very good left-hander. Um, now, in a very short sample, the strikeout stuff hasn't really materialized to the left side of the plate. We don't really care about that. The slider will be better, um, and he'll get more swing and miss there, but he's been excellent against righties here. Just a 197 average allowed, 270 Woba with a buck 41 ISO, 30% K rate. Some hard contact at 34%, so that would make him a little bit susceptible if he starts floating it. Uh, but he stays way down in the strike zone with the changeup. It's just an elite pitch. Four-seamer change combination here is very, very equitable and a good curveball. So despite not having the slider swing and miss stuff against the left side, um, he's really got it against the right side, and the Cubs are going to throw in seven righties against him probably at least tonight. So uh, I think McClanahan's fine. It's just a price tag that you're going to have to balance here. I think the ownership is, is an attackable figure for sure, and definitely the projection and value scores here. So um, I got nothing wrong fundamentally. Probably see a little bit of regression for McClanahan because he's got a 2-0 ERA with expected metrics, about a run, run and a half higher than that, and a very, very high strand rate here, north of 90%. So if it's going to come, that's probably where it will come. Uh, he does have a little bit of susceptibility into walk rate, and it's really to both sides. 12.5%, you know, in a short sample to the lefties, whatever, but a full 9% to the right-handers. So if he puts a couple of guys on base, a couple of these high upside righties could get to him, and that's where you see the strain rate tank, is when he walks a guy and then gives up a dinger. So uh, very reasonable. On a full 13-gamer, I usually don't like eating very high price tags on guys, um, but I, I think this is playable if you land on it. And, and can fit it in. Uh, on the other side, Kyle Hendricks, 6,600. The price is okay because he's got a really good changeup still. Uh, in his first start, he got you know picked apart. Um, I'm not sure he's totally comfortable with the pitch clock yet. So, excuse me, he... It, 
what has been out for uh two months because of um whatever it was in the shoulder i forget exactly what the injury was but he's not going to throw it past anybody anymore and that's really what's going to make it hard i mean this is tampa we did i don't know why we're really discussing this uh we're not playing kyle Hendricks against tampa I like this as, as kind of an off-the-board and sort of middle-of-the-road stack here. Expect Hendricks to be a little bit better, but you also don't expect Tampa to get nearly as torn apart as they did yesterday by Marcus Stroman, for example. So um, Kyle Hendricks much more attackable for Tampa, and I like getting to some stacks there. They're at better price tags and more playable price tags. Wander's prices come down, makes him more playable. Randy is still expensive at 57, and Brandon Lau at 51, Yandy at 47, Josh Lowe 49. So it's not like they're cheap, but they're cheaper than they have been, and that makes them uh, a little bit more playable here today. So not super excited about playing some Cubs and maybe some deep tournament one-off shots on, on a Seiya Suzuki or Patty Wisdom, who's finally under 4,000. He's at 36. But these guys are going to strike out in this particular matchup, and I don't like going after McClanahan. Really respect the arm. Okay, Minnesota and Houston. Joe Ryan, same thing here with 11-1. There's nothing wrong fundamentally for him. He'll give up a little bit more contact to the left side of the plate, but the four-seamer split-change combo are going to neutralize a lot of the power because the four-seam command is elite, elite tier for Joe Ryan, and the split change that he's brought in is also elite tier. Look at the value on this split. It's just so, so good. One of the better splitters. It's probably even better than Gosman's. Um, it's just absolutely incredible. And that neutralizes a lot of power to the left side here. Not like we're really worried about that with Houston because they're obviously going to go mostly right-handed heavy, but that takes me off of Jordan Alvarez at a very expensive price tag. And same thing with the Kyle Tucker. I don't want to play any lefties against Joe Ryan because of these two pitches here. They're, they're just top tier uh, and very difficult to get through. Look at this chase rate, 41%. We'd like to see more called strikes out of him, but when the chase rate is this high at 41%, he's getting this many swings outside of the strike zone. We don't really care if he gets a lot of called strikes because he's still at a 29% CSW with a 14% swing strike rate. So if we're going to see some regression for Joe, it's probably also going to come in the strand rate. Less regression, I would say, compared to uh, like a Shane McClanahan, for example. His expected metrics mostly in line, but still about a... A run, a full run delta between the ERA and the XBIP. 72% strike one is just off the charts good. So I don't want to go after Joe Ryan here at all uh, with Houston, even though they are healthier. Um, I like Joe Ryan here, and he'd probably be the one I prefer because he doesn't walk anybody, and if he's going to walk half as many batters as a Shane McClanahan, for example, uh, then I'd rather play Joe Ryan, and he's cheaper. So, uh, and he's at half the ownership. So, yeah, let's do that if I had to choose. But again, he's 11-1. I mean, this is not any bargain here on a full 13-game slate if you want to play some expensive offenses. Um, you can play some of the Twins, though, against Brandon Belock. He was good in his last outing. I believe it was his last out. Nope, it was the one before that against Oakland, where he's very good, where he struck out nine. Um, not so good against Milwaukee. Six and two-thirds, struck out just three, gave up four. Excuse me, gave up four earned runs. Um, I think this is also an attackable spot, once again, for the Twins. Belock, not overly impressive. He's got a little bit of swing and miss to the righties, but they're going to get some lefties here in the lineup against him tonight. Galli, uh, Gallo, Eddie Julian, and Alex Kirilov. Uh, Royce Lewis, they did just activate. He was their number one draft pick from a few seasons ago. He's going to be in there. Only shortstop eligibility here so far. Uh, same thing with Correa. So can't play both of those guys. Buxton's price coming down a little bit. He's still 5,600, though. Hitting for power, not so much against righties, and he'll strike out a little bit in this matchup. So I'd mostly prefer short stacks, I think, for the Twins in this particular matchup. Um, I don't really want to be playing B-Lock necessarily because of so many lefties that the Twins are going to throw at him. Um, in aggregate, however, like some of the lefties, like Eddie Julian and, and Joey Gallo, they're going to strike out too, you know, 26% aggregate K rate here. So they're very attackable with guys that can't blow it past them. At 6,800, I don't think this is a bad price play necessarily. Um, I wish the projections were a little bit higher, but he's okay here for somebody down in, in the 6K range. Probably a little bit expensive. Uh, but a 91% strand rate here in his four-star five appearances. 
so far this season. Probably going to see some regression there because he's got an ERA of three and a half with an X ERA of six and, a, and an X FIP of four and a half. So probably some regression coming there as well. High barrel rate so far at 15%. So this is really why I'd like to get to some of the twins. Very high barrel rates from a couple of these guys. And they did just activate a guy like uh, Max Kepler who hits righties very well. So I'd mostly prefer the twins here and some Joe Ryan, but I'm not jacked about 11-1 to be quite honest. Okay, Angels and the White Sox. Tyler Anderson, he finally, finally, finally had a serviceable start in his last outing. Finally. And he was, what, 6,500 against Boston? Um, and he, he got through him. But he only struck out three, and he survived six innings. So th he got a win out of this, too. And he still only popped four, 17 G DK points. I mean, that's really about the upside for Tyler Anderson anymore, and I think this is a really bad matchup for him in particular against the righties. He's really given it up, a full 294 average, 372 Woban, 223 ISO to the right side with a 13.5% K rate. Now, it's not so much there in, in hard contact. He's always induced a lot of soft contact just because of a pretty damn good changeup and the cutter mix that he's thrown inducing soft and some ground balls to the right side. But he's got an 055 this season, ground ball to fly ball ratio against the right side. And that ain't good. So I think he's very attackable. No swing and miss here. The walk rate is ballooned quite significantly as well. It's a short sample, a lot to the lefties so far, but it's still a full 9% against righties and 165 hitters here. So uh, it's not like that's a small number, 9%. Very attackable here still is Tyler Anderson. Low upside offense, of course, because the White Sox generally just don't create. They're pretty average all the way around, but they're healthy now, man. This is the healthy White Sox. Tim Anderson back, Eloy back, Luis Robert. Looks like the hip problem is behind him. Yoan Moncada have been back for a little while as well now. So I think the only guy they're missing really is like an Elvis Andrews or something. So they've got Hanser Alberto. Um down at the bottom, playing in the middle infield for him. But he doesn't really strike out. So I think this is a very difficult matchup for Tyler Anderson. I'd like to probably get to some White Sox here again tonight. Eloy is 3,200, and he'll probably be in the two. Yoan Moncada, 42. Luis Robert, 46. Tim Anderson hits like 340 against lefties. Not a lot of power there, but he's 4,700, very playable. Vaughn, Jake Berger also have popped from the right side. The only one I really don't want to play here is probably Yasmani Grandal from the right side. Prefer him more against righties from the left side, but Clint Frazier is very playable too at 2,100 in the outfield. So I think the Sox are very workable stack here tonight, kind of off the board. If you want to play some correlated stuff with Lucas Giolito, I think it's okay. Um, Giolito's been a little variant this year, kind of up and down, he, but really compared to all of the White Sox starters, he's probably been their best arm outside of the resurgence by uh, Michael Kopech over his last several starts. In any case, Giolito, 9,200. I'm not super jacked about the price, uh, but I think it's a playable tag here for him because he's really established and got rid of all the negative four-seamer value that he was displaying last season. He's really brought down the production um, or the same handed production against righties that he was given up last season. I mean, he was at like 250 ISOs nearly for a good part of, of last year. And he's got this down to 175. Um, so the slider is still a work in progress here, but it's allowing him when he's establishing with the four seamer to survive a lot better. Like the walk rate, like he walked seven guys in his last outing. That's total noise here because he doesn't really walk people all that often. He's still on the barrel a little bit, mostly to the left side, and that's because the changeup has really not been very good. Um, but a full 13 mile an hour delta here, 12 and 13 miles an hour on the change to the four seamer, that's very, very strong. So I'm looking for some regression positive in the change of value here for him. And the slider is basically just break even here. So um, he's got a workable three pitch mix now, and it's not nearly as bad and attackable with offenses as it was last season. So at 92, I think it's okay to, to play him here. I like this projection, and he's north of 30 in the value score, which is really kind of the threshold we look for for starting pitchers. Um, and the Angels here, they're expensive too. In order to play the guys you want, like you got you to spend up for Trout and Otani, and that's not great. They have some cheaper guys like a Mickey Moniak, Jared Walsh, um, Matt Theis from the left side if you want to do that, as Giolito will give, a, give up a little bit more power to the lefties here. 
not my favorite playing the Angels, but I think a uh, Moniac, maybe an Otani, Jared Walsh, a little short stack, I think is fine. And throw in Trout as well if you can make it happen because Giolito is a bit more of a fly ball pitcher this season to the right side, and Trout's a fly ball, or excuse me, he's a ground ball pitcher to the right side, and Trout is a fly ball hitter. So uh, I think it's a playable in a short stack, but not my favorite. Really no Tyler Anderson for me. Just some White Sox. I think it's an intriguing stack. Okay, Yankees and Seattle. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, with the Nestor, man. I don't trust this guy. <laughs> you know, I, I don't trust him to be able to go deeper into games just yet, despite a pretty equitable four-seamer cutter mix here. The changeup that he's really not using a lot, but when he throws it, it's been getting torched here. And the slider's really not giving him all that much value yet. I need some more swing and miss out of him from the from the left side. Um this came up about four ticks in his last outing, right? We still have a very short sample for him, but he's given up some pop here to the righties, and it's a little bit concerning. Um, the cutter is usually a very good pitch for him, but it hasn't been all that great, and the four-seamer, same sort of deal here. So um like to see, maybe it's just like kind of early season woes, but I mean, we got 10 starts out of the, out of the guy so far this year and it's just kind of been underwhelming i'm not totally sure what the deal is here with Nestor, but he's on the barrel a little bit uh to the right side of the plate and most of all it's just like the fly ball problem here so um a little bit of hard contact and and the cutter really hasn't been super excellent 204 iso with a 267 average and a 345 wobo to the right it's not because of walks it's just he's putting guys on base. So I think it's a location and a perhaps even a sequencing issue that's getting him there. We should probably see some positive regression for him. Um, but he's got an ERA and an XFIP right in right in line here. The EX ERA is kind of a noisy stat. 67% strand rate is probably where we would see it come. Um, and probably see a few more ground balls. He's never been this heavy of a fly ball pitcher to the right side in particular. That's because of the cutter. Um, so we're looking for a little bit of positive cutter regression for Nestor at 8,600. Is he playable? Uh, yeah, I guess at um, against the the Mariners. Sure, they've been awful against left-handed pitching. Just so so underwhelming. 26% aggregate K rate. Maybe a couple of these guys are starting to heat up a little bit. Julio in particular, maybe a Ty France. But Gino, he's always hit lefties pretty okay even though he's just dreadful against righties. Uh, Tay Oscar is going to strike out against everybody. Um, so he's been very frustrating to play. Don't really want Cal Raleigh at 5,100 from the right side of the plate necessarily. So kind of a hard team to stack here because they still got JP and Kelnick up there at the left, um, from the left side of the plate at the top of the lineup. And I don't really want to play any lefties here. So I would probably have to side with Nestor because I still think there are some strikeouts hidden from a Julio and a Gino and a Tay Oscar. But I'm kind of lukewarm about the price. Uh, I don't really trust him to be going a full six innings. And in this in this matchup, I think it's a little bit dangerous because they still have some righties that hit lefties pretty well. So I'm kind of lukewarm on it. I'll have to dig in a little bit more to you know before I start building teams. Uh, Logan Gilbert on the other side. I like this 10-1 or 10-2, excuse me, um, compared to like an 11-1 for Joe Ryan or 11-4 for McClanahan. Uh, I think I'd like to get to some of this here. Um, I think the the Yankees are very attackable still with, with righties that have very good stuff. Just a 22% aggregate K rate and an average batted ball profile really across the board for the Yankees uh, everywhere else. They'll make some hard contact, but it's mostly from Judge, who hit two bombs again last night. Uh, but Logan Gilbert, his he's really solved a lot of the, the right-handed problems that he's exhibited in the past. Um, or he's got them a bit more under control. He's never walked anybody, and he's mostly stayed off of the barrel. But four-seamer really command and location was kind of the problem. He gives up a little bit of pop to the right side of the plate, but in his full 10 starts this season, he's really dialed that in. Um, and the whole arsenal has been very good for him. Four-seamer splitter slider curveball, that keeps him down you know, against the... Uh, against the righties now, and he's not giving up near as much hard contact and power as he did last season, for example. And the split here has been a really, really good swing and miss pitch for him against the left side. Good chase, 35% nearly, full 12% swinging strike rate, 17% call strike rate, 
29% CSW, it's good with a full 30% aggregate K rate. We may even see some positive regression for Logan Gilbert here. 360 ERA with expected metrics, about a half a run to a run lower than that. Strain rate, 66%, pretty low here. The whip is strong at 092. Yeah, that might drift up a little bit, but it's not going to be because of walk. So um, overall, I, I think this is a very playable price here at 10-2, and I don't see anything wrong fundamentally. I think we can go after some of the Yankees here. Uh, I like Logan Gilbert here a pretty decent bit. 31 in the value score is, is very strong. Um, maybe some short stacks in Seattle. Probably no Yankees for me here tonight. Yeah, you can always play Judge, of course. But um, everybody else is kind of expensive. I mean, like the guys that you'd want to play, like Glaber and Anthony Rizzo, do you really want to be playing DJ and Willie Calhoun and IKF or Jake Bowers in this matchup? I mean, not really. So mostly just Gilbert here for me. I think um, maybe a little bit of Nestor, but I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm kind of lukewarm on the price. Okay, let's move on to Bryce Elder and his 45% hard contact rate. Um, unfortunately, we can't really fade Bryce Elder tonight. Like, at 9300 this is a playable price, and he's only 14% owned. So, yeah, let's sign me up against Oakland. Um, the strikeout, the raw strikeout stuff isn't all that attractive, just 21.5% in aggregate, really to both sides. And the hard contact rate is super worrisome here. Look at the soft contact, 3%. This is one of the lowest figures. Like, I had to check again this morning that I, th I thought this was an error because it was so low. 48% uh, hard is just out of control bad. And he's surviving so far with very high ground ball stuff. Uh, but this this cannot persist. He's got an exceptionally high strand rate. And as we talked about in his last start, he's got suppression metrics looking to fall off a cliff here, given this hard contact rate. I know the ground ball stuff is good, but as I mentioned in his last start, there's one starting pitcher over a large sample that's been able to sustain a 4-0 ground ball to fly ball ratio, or any, really anything north of three, uh, and that's Framber Valdez. There's a couple of guys that have really good ground ball stuff, and he'll have that with the two-seamer slider change combination. Um, but we still only have a 100-inning sample on him since he came up last year. And I'm still looking, like, this hard contact number is not sustainable. He will get beat up eventually. He's got to figure this out. Um, unfortunately, like I said, we can't fade him. So you got to play him at this price tag against Oakland because Oakland is bad. They may put together a little bit of contact, and they did get Seth Brown back. So I will certainly, uh, I, I think it's a very good idea to have Seth Brown exposure whenever he's getting a right-hander. Um and especially one that's going to keep him on the ground for the most part, or try to, with a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball to the left side for Elder. Uh, that's a good batted ball profile matchup for a good fly ball hitter like Seth Brown. Um, so I think he's really the only one I, I would like to get a little bit of uh, on the other side, looking to capitalize on some of this hard contact. Um, but really not so much any of the right-handers. Maybe a Brent Rooker, 3,300, he's a, at a much better and playable price. So possibly a short stack. Esteri Ruiz, Brent Rooker, Seth Brown. Shea's got a little bit of pop from the right side. So if you want to get to like a way off the board Oakland stack here, I mean, it's okay. They're actually popping a little bit higher in the value scores and um, in the ownership than you would kind of expect on a full 13 game slate. So that it's playable because this is going to fall off a cliff eventually. I don't, I don't think it's going to be today, but this is not sustainable. This, you know, He's going to regress very hard very soon, and he'll get picked apart. It's just unlikely to be against Oakland. J.P. Sears, I don't generally like stacking against J.P. Sears because I think he's the best um, starter that is not hurt for Oakland. He's the most serviceable usually because he doesn't walk pretty much anybody, uh, and that allows him to survive deeper into games. But he's got a huge, huge barrel rate, and it's mostly to the right side of the plate. So against Atlanta, this is one of the more popular offenses. They're probably going to be the most popular here today. Um, you get, you just can't do this. 226 average, not a lot there. 329 woe, but not a lot there. It's because of the microscopic uh, walk rate to the right side, but it's 274 ISO, two righties here with a two and a half homers per nine. That's not super noisy. It is a little bit, yeah, just 177 hitters here, but um, a lot of fly balls here and really a very high barrel rate. So with a bad change and bad four-seamer really just yielding outs to the field here, 
it's going to make it very difficult for him to get right-handed hitters out, and obviously Atlanta is full of them. So there are playable prices here today too. 64 for Acuna, 5 for Austin Riley, 47 for Sean Murphy back in Oakland. Ozuna at 29 is playable if he's in the 5-hole. Ozzie Albies at 4,500, like him a little bit better from the right side. He's at 45. Arcia playable too at 35, or Kevin Pillar at 21. So playable here, and but you're not going to be fooling anybody. On a 13-gamer, not going to be hard to get to Atlanta, and I think it's a, it's pretty warranted. Um, some of these guys will garner a little bit more ownership than, than probably they should, but, uh, it, it's not like that's hard to really navigate around on a full 13 game slate. There's plenty of other spots that you can get different with. So, um, I think it's warranted to get to Atlanta and I'm going to be getting to it as, as much as I can here with these high upside righties, uh, very, very attackable spot here, uh, against JP Sears, too many fly balls, um, to the, the right side of the plate. So Atlanta pretty much exclusively, maybe like a short stack of Oakland, I guess. Okay, Colorado and Arizona. Let's try and blast through this here as quickly as possible. Kyle Freeland, 6,500. Uh, it's a playable kais- price for Kyle, um, but a very difficult matchup here. Arizona's seen him a lot. He's seen them a lot. So I'm kind of lukewarm uh, in in that regard. You, you often see... Um, things sort of flatten out and when when teams see a lot of one starting pitcher like within a division for example um and you don't really see the extremes of of the numbers too often so that kind of makes it a little difficult to stack against Kyle in particular sometimes because he goes out there and battles man he, he and sometimes he'll he'll throw together some pretty good outings he's got good fastball equity so far this season and when you can establish with fastballs even though you've got subpar breaking stuff um that allows you to establish and get into equitable and favorable counts where you can dictate where you want them to go so that makes it hard to stack against kyle sometimes uh, because he'll go out there and, and he'll give you six and you can just bang your head against a wall when you've got a boatload of arizona on the other side um just an average offense in terms of production, buck 50 ISO, 33% hard contact, 23% K rate, 6% walk rate. Everything just pretty average all the way around. A lot of ground balls here. So in this particular matchup, I think I would like to get to some Arizona because against righties, Kyle's still giving up a full 37% hard contact. And despite the survivability, I suppose, uh, this is still a very attackable number, 37% hard against any one side of the plate. So I think we can go after him. Still giving up a 200 ISO and a 37% hard. And those numbers really, you can't fake all that much. Certainly the hard contact number when pitching at Coors Field. Yeah, the ISO and the homer numbers and, and all that kind of stuff does tend to get inflated sometimes. And given that he does throw a lot of his innings at Coors Field, these are still pretty damn respectable numbers outside of the hard contact. So that's what kind of makes it difficult to stack against him uh, with full Arizona here. But they're very playable price tags. that You can get to whoever you want, including Zach Gallen on the mound, uh, if you play a lot of Arizona here. Lourdes Gurriel, 4,400. Cattell Marte's fine, 49. 29 for Manny Rivera. Walker, I like at 46. Longo at 31, I think that's fine too. Gabby Moreno, uh, very low power numbers and a lot of ground balls himself. So it's fine at 32 in stacks, but not my favorite. Don't really want to play any lefties here necessarily, but you can always play Corbin Carroll. Go ahead. And all of those price tags will make it gettable. Uh, A 10-7 price tag for Zach Allen here. 31% 31% ownership, like I said at the outset. Do we have to eat this? No, not necessarily. Um, but it's going to be very hard if you're just building teams to avoid a 21% median projection and this kind of value score here. A full 2-0 point per dollar with a guy at this price tag is kind of hard to get to. Um, they're kind of hard to avoid and, and get to in terms of projection, <laughs> right? So this is a high number, and, and he's very playable. This is a good matchup. Even though, I mean, this is Colorado on the road, right? Even though Colorado's been a lot better against right-handers this year. 22%, sub-22% aggregate strikeout rate. This is above average now, and they're not nearly as attackable as they have been in the past. 91 WRC+, plus just because they don't hit with runners in scoring position all that efficiently. And they've got some pretty low upside hitters, generally. But if they get Chris Bryant going again, 
uh, who's been slumping quite heavily recently. Ryan McMahon's been excellent the last week or so, finally. Um, Elias Diaz has been great really all season. Hard price tags to, you know, hard to stomach at Elias Diaz at 4,900. And you're not really stacking against Gallon. Um, is it enough to take me off of a full 30% Gallon, though, on a, on a 13 game slate? Yeah, I think maybe. So if I had to build teams right now, I'd probably just come in underweight to this number um, because there's a lot of other arms I think we can play, right? But it doesn't mean that he's a bad play. There's nothing wrong fundamentally or anything here. He's got picked apart. And struggled a little bit, kind of lost it uh, in his last couple of starts. But nothing horrible here, you know. Like, he had Pittsburgh where they they really got to him. The strikeout stuff just kind of hasn't been there. And this is kind of the M.O. with Gallon. He loses the whiff stuff on occasion, but he re he could reestablish no problem. And when he gets going, uh, like, he struck out north of 10 three times this season alone. So... That's that's not a problem. He can absolutely pick through even a low strikeout offense uh, like the Rockies here. So I have no problems playing Gallon. It's just an ownership figure that would really kind of take me off, I think. So maybe just like some Gallon and short Arizona pieces or something like that. So I'm not super wild about it. I don't want to stack Colorado, and I certainly don't want to play Freeland. Um, but kind of off of Arizona a little bit. I don't know. I'm just I'll probably end up with a crap load. But because um, they're, what, third in, in value score right now in aggregate as a team. Um, but overall, I, I don't know, kind of lukewarm on it. Anyway, let's move on. Pirates and the Giants here late in San Francisco. Yohan Oviedo on the mound. Slider's been a little bit better over his last couple of starts. Um, we're trying to see... If, if he can get back to the early season levels when we were planning him a lot, uh, he's back down at that same sort of price range, mid six Ks, you know, he's not up at 8,000 or whatever he was. Um, so 6,400 is nice. And the giants here are attackable because they will strike out. However, the strikeout stuff in aggregate, right? Just 19%, 22.5% to the lefties. is probably not good enough. And it's because of the lack of a changeup. If he had a change up here, it would give him more swing and miss. The fastball is still hard to get to here with him. So he's similar to like an Eddie Cabrera with a bad fastball, good breaking stuff, but bad fastball and, and hard to establish early in the count. And we see it translate to a full walk rate here at 10%. 59% strike one, just a 26% uh, chase rate here. So that's not all that encouraging. Staying off the barrel and staying down in the strike zone to lefties. So I think it makes him uh, serviceable and playable at 6,400 if you land on it. Um, it kind of takes me off of the Giants more than I would like to play Oviedo, I think. But uh, that's kind of where I am on, on Oviedo. I, I want to see more out of the fastball here and a little bit more equity out of the slider. And he's got to throw this change up more, man, in order to get more swing and miss to neutralize power to the left side. Even though the curveball has been very good and keeping him out of trouble so far, um... He's still giving up a little bit of pop, 33% hard contact with a suspicious 169 ISO to the lefties here. So a little bit susceptible um, to some of these guys. Do you want to stack San Francisco on a full 13 gamer? Well, they've got enough power to get there. Unfortunately, it's in San Francisco and it's 55 degrees here tonight. You know, so like the ballpark is still going to play down power um, a little bit when it's when it's cool in San Francisco. And that kind of takes me off a lot of the fly ball hitters. Because I don't think Oviedo is really going to give up all that much in the air here tonight. You know, despite a you know a, a decent line drive bat a ball matchup here. He doesn't give up all that much in a line either. So I'm kind of meh on the Giants. John Brebby on the mound. We can just get through this real quick. He's just going to open. Don't know who it's going to be behind him. And whoever it is, they're probably only going to, th going to throw like two or three innings. Even if it's like a Sean Mania who is probably stretched out for like three or four. He hasn't thrown in like a week, I think. So it'll probably be him. Um... Does that put me onto the Pirates? No, not really. Maybe like a Rody Castro or a Connor Joe or something. Connor Joe down to 3,400. I think this ballpark plays up his skill set, his batted ball profile a little bit. Um, Same with Kutch. I think that's playable at 36, but uh, don't really want to play pretty much anybody else. Um, maybe a Cabrian Hayes. He's 41, though. Do you really want to play him at third base on a full 13-gamer um, in San Francisco? I mean, yeah, not really. So kind of off of this game for the most part. Okay, Washington and the Dodgers, we're not off of this game. We're going to get to a lot of the Dodgers here. You can't play Jake Irvin, I don't think. Um, 
even though the numbers, the suppression numbers, soft contact number against right-handers has been very good, it's really not there against left-handers with a hard or a high hard contact rate against the lefty. 35% with a full 2.1 homers per nine. Yeah, we got a short sample here. Just 100 total hitters, 54 to the lefties. But a 250 ISO so far, and it's really the whiff stuff that's not there. He's got a 16% walk rate with a 19% aggregate strikeout rate, 52% strike one. He's gonna be he's gonna be putting a lot of guys on base here tonight. I, I think against the Dodgers, full 11% walk rate against right-handers this year, 35% hard, 209 ISO, balls in the air and on the line. It is a disaster zone for Jake Irvin tonight. I think, um, and they're probably gonna come in as the second most popular team. And if I had to choose, I would choose the Dodgers over Atlanta for a top stack today. Um, I think Jake Irvin, it's, it's about time for him to get really blown apart here. And this is a horrible, horrible matchup for his skill set. Um, he just doesn't throw it past anybody, and he walks too many people. So give me a lot of the Dodgers. You can play Gonsolin, too, at 8,000. I think it's very playable. Uh, I've talked about this in his last couple starts. He's stretched out enough again. We still have problems with Gonsolin going deep enough into games. Um what, twice this season in his, I don't know, six, seven starts or something that he's gone more than five innings. So that's kind of an issue. Uh, at 8,000, that's a little, that's kind of priced in, though. And this is a hard strikeout matchup. The strikeout stuff for him really just hasn't been there this season, sub-20% when he was mid-20s last year. So that kind of takes me off a little bit. And I'm not all that jacked about playing him. You can play him, though, because he's probably going to get a lot of run support here. Um, and if he's rolling, then I think that's perfectly reasonable to see a, a full six innings out of him, even against Washington and a very low strikeout team here, just an 84 WRC plus for him. They don't hit for any power. So I don't have a problem going after the nationals here with a, um, you know, with a, a relatively respectable upside arm here in Tony Gonsolin. The problem is he's given up a lot of fly balls, and they hit so many ground balls that I think you could see a line drive sort of barrage here tonight from the Nationals, which would, you know, with a low strikeout rate and some line drives, it could make it a kind of an abbreviated outing once again for Tony Gonsolin. So that would really be the only thing that kind of takes me off. Um, but I, I do like correlated stacks here because, like I said, he's going to get a lot. He's very likely to get a lot of run support here. And I'm going to try and get as much as the Dodgers as I can. Uh, okay, so that's long. Uh, but I think we are done. Let's go over stacks quickly. Cleveland and Baltimore don't really want any pitching here. I think both of these guys are in play at their relative price tags or respective price tags. Um, Baltimore, if I had to choose an offense, I'm not playing Cleveland on a full 13-game slate. It's just not happening. Even against Kyle Gibson, they're just too bad. Uh, Milwaukee and Toronto, still looking for Milwaukee to regress a little bit. I think this is probably the spot for that. So I'll probably have a little bit of some Milwaukee right-handed short stacks, I think, against Yusei Kikuchi. He's just given up way too much power to the right. He's, he just hasn't fixed it yet. Takes me off of him even at 8400 I think it's a playable price tag, and Milwaukee's been horrible. So, yeah, throw it in there. But the K-rate's down, and the power is up for Kikuchi, so no thanks. Uh, Toronto, yeah, you can play against Milwaukee and Adrian Hauser, but I'm kind of off of them as well. High ground ball rate for Hauser makes it hard to play a lot of Toronto outside of like my, uh, Matt Chapman. Philly and the Mets, kind of on the Mets here. I'm off of Kodai Senga. I'm off of Ranger Suarez. I need to see more from him. Uh, the bad strikeout matchup too. I don't really, you're going to need a lot from your starting pitchers tonight. And Kodai Senga is only going to go five innings. He's going to walk 12 guys, so no thanks. Um, so Mets, though, for sure, some right-handed short stacks I think is, is pretty viable. Cincy and Boston, you play a couple of these lefties here against Brian Bayo, but at 7K, I like Brian Bayo in the mid-range. Probably still going to be six or, or seven righties in the lineup uh, for Cincinnati tonight, and that makes Bayo pretty playable. Strikeout stuff's there, ground ball stuff's there. Uh, it's all coming into uh, coming into form here. Walk rate's down. So uh, I, I like this a decent bit. Ben Lively on, there's, uh, on the other side for the Reds. Um, probably going to be in wait and see mode. I think certainly in this matchup, I don't want to go out of my way to be targeting, uh, Boston here tonight. Yeah. Uh, you can get to some Boston stacks if you can make the prices happen. They're expensive for the guys you want to play. Uh, but it's perfectly reasonable to go after some regression for Ben Lively. He's been very good his last two starts. Probably not so much going forward. Casey and St. Louis. I like both offenses here. Uh, really no pitching. I don't want to play Michaelis, even though the Royals are bad. 
against right-handed pitching. Uh, he just doesn't have the, the K stuff. He's got monster line drive rates here. So I like the Royals a good bit. Uh, same with St. Louis. I, I think Zach Greinke could very well get torn apart here again tonight. Uh, Tampa and Chicago. I like Tampa here a good bit against Kyle Hendricks. I'm going to have to see more from him also. And if you can make an 11-4 Shane McClanahan happen on the mound, yeah, by all means. I've got no problems with this. Maybe a couple of short little pieces of the Cubs, some of the home run hitters, because if we're going to see regression for McClanahan, it's probably going to come in the walk rate and, and leaving guys on base and then giving up a dinger. Uh, Minnesota and Houston, probably just Minnesota here for me tonight. I like Joe Ryan as well. Uh, we can get to him at 11-1. He's expensive, however, and this is a difficult matchup now with um, Altuve back at the top of the lineup. Uh, he's still elite against right-handers, though, and the split change is, against lefties has been very, very good. Uh, B-Lock probably not here tonight. I like some of these lefties for Minnesota. Probably some short stacks because the whole lineup for Minnesota really just kind of stinks. Um, so no Houston, I don't think for me tonight, probably just going to leave them on the shelf. Angels, White Sox, really like the White Sox here tonight, uh, against Tyler Anderson. All of, they're getting healthy now and they're very playable price tags. You can play some Giolito too. No Tyler Anderson, maybe some Angels, um, in some short lefty stacks with, with, with a trout four man or something like that. That's okay, but I don't really want to go out of my way to do that. Yankees, Seattle, uh, maybe a couple of short Seattle stacks, I think, but a good bit of Logan Gilbert. I like this a lot. Nestor, yeah, sure, he's playable at uh, 8,600. I think it's fine, and Seattle's bad, you know, against lefties this season. They've been awful. Uh, but outside of that, no Yankees for me. Atlanta, definitely. No Oakland. Short stacks, maybe, but no J.P. Sears. Some Bryce Elder, yeah, he's playable. Um, and even though he's going to regress hard, it's probably not going to be tonight. Colorado and Arizona, don't want to play Colorado at all. Zach Allen, for sure. Arizona, maybe just a little bit. Um, not super jacked about stacking against Kyle. You can get to some really high upside fly ball and line drive hitters from the Diamondbacks over here, like Christian Walker, Lord Escariel, something like that. Pittsburgh and San Francisco, probably off of this game almost entirely. Maybe a couple one-offs of San Francisco, but I'm not really interested, uh, to be quite honest. Um, Connor Joe in the outfield, I like at 3,400. That's fine, but uh, outside of that, Really, probably nothing for me. Washington and the Dodgers, all of the Dodgers, probably zero Washington, even against Tony Gonsolin, who's not striking anybody out. Um, I'm not sure I want to go after Maybe a Luis Garcia or a Corey Dickerson kind of left-handed piece there. Jamer, I don't really want to play a 38 uh, at third base here tonight. So um, that's it. Pretty long here today. But uh, once again, keep an eye out for projection and ownership pushes as we will have several updates throughout the day as soon as lineups start rolling in. Good luck to everybody on this Monster 13 Gamer.